Here's the book that he mentioned a moment ago. You have the right to remain innocent. As it says up there, it's also available in audio version if you'd like to have the thrill of hearing me read the book to you and to your children as you're getting ready for bed. <laughs> a couple of brief, before I talk about the book, let me just make a couple of quick brief introductory comments about myself. For the benefit of those of you who are thinking to yourself, well, who is this guy? Why should I listen to him? Why should I care about his opinion? That's a fair question. Uh, I'm nobody of any particular stature, but I know some important people. There's uh, Justice Anton and Scalia and me, a picture of us taken together in his chambers, actually just a few months before his tragic and untimely demise. Uh, just before we went out to lunch together, he was, uh, I'm a great admirer of that man. He was a legal giant. Uh, and here, for those of you on the left, is my friend Loretta Lynch, the US Attorney General, and me, posing together at our recent uh, college reunion. We were college and law school classmates, and I'm a, also a great fan of hers as well. I, I'm not sure, but I think I may be the only American who actually hugged Loretta and Nino both in the past year. But I need to give you a little trigger warning. For those of you who are fans of one or the other, I need to warn you right up front that before I'm done, I'm going to have some somewhat irreverent things to say about them both, or at least about the Obama administration and the Eric Holder Justice Department and Justice Scalia and the conservative branch of the Supreme Court, and how it is that they have almost nothing in common except for one thing, that they don't understand the Fifth Amendment and they don't care deeply enough about its extraordinary value to you and me and to every other American citizen. As Tim mentioned a moment ago, I'm honored to be able to say that the book has attracted some great praise from Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and a half dozen other prominent individuals. You can read their glowing endorsements on the Amazon webpage. One of them, Professor Larry Tribe from Harvard Law School, was kind enough to write that this book's amazing but true stories of innocent people exonerated after decades of wrongful imprisonment, which they could have avoided if they had insisted on their fundamental right to avoid self-incrimination, are riveting reminders of the high price we pay as individuals and as a society when we fail to assert our constitutional rights. That's what the book is all about educating the American public so that you and they will all come to understand how critical it is that we understand and be unashamed and unapologetic, full-throated, publicly even, in our vigorous defense of our constitutional rights, not ashamed in the presence of the police who are trying to coerce you or manipulate you into thinking there was something underhanded about asserting your rights or standing up for your rights. Believe me, when the shoe is on the other foot and they find themselves on the other end of the table and they're told that they're being investigated by internal affairs, or when Lois Lerner is told that Congress wants to do some investigating into the certain mis um, in, in, improprieties apparently being committed by her office, she clamps up in a heartbeat and takes the Fifth Amendment and then goes to collect her pension. I've, since this video went viral about eight years ago, I have been deluged almost every day with hundreds, probably thousands of emails and letters from all kinds of people with all kinds of questions. I haven't got time to answer all of them today. We've also got some questions coming in live on Twitter, and I'll only be able to answer about 20 of them, but I will answer for your benefit about 20 of the most important questions that I've received over that many of you may be wondering about this book. Question number one that I've often asked, my motivation. Why did you write this book? Was it for the money? Is that why you're in it? Absolutely and emphatically not. In fact, I, shame on you for even supposing such a thing. Anybody who knows the truth of the matter, you'll be, you'll be embarrassed when you find out the truth. Under the terms of my royalty arrangement with Amazon Publishing, which I actually have no obligation to make public, but under the terms of my unusual royalty arrangement with Amazon Publishing, I will not receive one dime in revenue or income or money of any kind after we have sold the first 500 million copies. After that, <laughs> after that point in time, every dime that would have gone to me instead will be shunted directly into a charitable, not-for-profit, uh, personal foundation called the Duane Family Foundation that was set up for my benefit by the same attorneys and accountants who are working for the Clinton Foundation, and every bit of that money will be ostensibly earmarked for the public benefit after the first 90% is spent on opulent travel and trips for me and my family around the world. <laughs> and let me also underscore on a more serious note, I did not write this book and I have not made this cause my apparent life's project for the benefit of making money for criminal defense attorneys. On YouTube, there have been thousands of things written about me, various comments, I don't have time to read them all, I'm happy to say probably good for my benefit that I don't. Most of them are very much in agreement. Very few of them are actually critical or, or express any kind of disagreement. But far and away, the, most no, the number one most common criticism that I do get when I do get blowback is from people who say dismissively, well, of course, he'll say you need to ask for a lawyer. He's a lawyer himself. Well, in all seriousness, these people have no idea how far they are from the mark. Because this book and the promotion of the theme behind this book is by no means to make more money for criminal defense attorneys. Quite the opposite. If this book can somehow be placed in the hands of every young person in America, I can absolutely absolutely and unconditionally guarantee you that the number of criminal defense attorneys who will have too, much, too many cases to handle will suddenly and dramatically decline. There will be much less work for criminal defense attorneys, including myself, to handle if we can get people at the front end to wise up and to smarten up and to keep their mouth shut. So why did I write the book? In all seriousness, I'll tell you why. My motivation is twofold. Number one, 
because this country is convicting far too many innocent people for crimes that they did not commit. It ought to be a national scandal. It ought to be a national disgrace. It seems almost once a week you pick up the paper and you read about some poor schlep, more often than not a member of a racial minority who's let out of prison because 20 years after he was sentenced to a life term, he, we find DNA evidence that now where the belatedly confirms apparently, whoops, we got the wrong guy. We give this guy our apologies, we pat him on the back, we give him a small check, and then we forget all about him. And then we turn our attention back to Brangelina or some other exciting thing in the news. No, we had to call a national timeout. And we had to ask what in the world, what in God's name are we doing? How is it that on our watch so many innocent people are being convicted? How many? We don't even know for sure. We all know about the extraordinary work being done by the Innocent Project, which has already worked laboriously to secure the release of over 340 innocent men and women convicted of horrible crimes, some of them a death row, before they were ultimately released and proved to be innocent. That program is also, by the way, run by a former classmate of mine, Maddie DeLong. Hi, Maddie. <laughs> I admire greatly the work that they're doing at the Innocence Project. I yield to nobody in my admiration for the work they do, but it is a national scandal that they should be doing this work at all. I'm trying to do my part to supplement her efforts at the front end by trying to see to it that fewer people get convicted for crimes that they did not commit. And I guarantee you that if enough young people read this book, there is no question that we will start convicting immediately fewer innocent people. We will have fewer false convictions. How many? Nobody can say for sure. But even if there's only a few, then all the work that I did on this book will have been time well spent. And the other thing, my other related motivation, is to bring to an end once and for all the absolutely obscene and hypocritical double standard, the discrepancy, the grotesque discrepancy between what police officers tell your children and tell you every day, all night, all over the country, and what they go home and privately tell their own children. I'm not trying to impugn their honesty or their integrity as a general matter, as I emphatically emphasize in the book. That's nothing personal. I'm not trying to suggest that police officers, by and large, are less honorable or honest than your average individual on the street. They're just doing what they've been trained to do ever since they started on the job. At the police academy from day one, they're given sophisticated training in elaborate methods of deception and trickery and dishonesty in ways that are designed to get guilty and innocent people both to talk and to make admissions, damaging admissions that can be used to help convict them, in some cases, of crimes that they didn't even commit. And then when they get on the job and they start using these tactics, they get nothing but ratification, support, confirmation, and corroboration from the courts that are routinely giving them a nice, well, well done, add a boy, good job, you did it again. We'll allow this confession to be used even though you told this guy the most unspeakable lies. Well done, officer, now you get back to work and keep on doing it. And yet when these same officers go at home at night, how do they sleep with themselves? I'll tell you how they sleep. They go at home. They, they get home, and they open the door, and they say, they say to the wife, hey, hey, where are the kids? Where are the twins? And the kids come running into the room, and, the, and, and they grab the kids in their arms, and they say, come here, come here, Jennifer, Joel. And with tears running down their face, the police officers say to the kids, promise me for the love of God that as long as you live, you will never let any police officer do to you what I do to other people's kids all day long. And it sounds like a joke, but it really is an accurate paraphrase of the reality. I've been all over the country talking to thousands of young people in the past five years about this subject. Everywhere I go, without exception, I ask every audience, anybody here have a mom or a dad who's a police officer or a prosecutor? There's always one or two. I ask them every time, what do your parents tell you about the Fifth Amendment? Every time, no exception. 100% of them say, they said the same thing. They told me when I was a young kid, very young, don't ever talk to the police. Don't ever agree to talk to them. If the police say, can I ask you a couple of questions? You say no. That's why the subtitle of this book is what police officers tell their own children about the Fifth Amendment. Next question. The most common question I get in email, I get this one all the time, what about traffic stops? Is it okay if I talk to a police officer during the course of a routine traffic stop? Yes, all right, let's just get that out of the way quickly. <laughs> At the risk of stating what ought to be obvious, that is completely different in a hundred obvious ways, not the least of which is the fact that the police officers have virtually unbridled discretion to let you off with a warning this time and to let you go without giving you a ticket if, they seems, if it seems to them that you're not a public menace, that you aren't drunk, that you are uh, suitably respectful and courteous, and that's not going to happen with a murder investigation. They're not going to let you off because you seem to be really sorry for what you have done. <laughs> but I will, give you this, I will give you this one little bit of free legal advice. When you do get stopped and pulled over by the police, you shouldn't talk any more than necessary. Don't allow them to get you in a conversation about whether you, what you did wrong or whether you know what you did wrong. Just tell them, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do anything wrong. I didn't mean to violate the law. And if I did, I appreciate you bringing it to my attention, officer. If they suspect that you have been driving while intoxicated and they ask you, if you could recite the alphabet backwards. You don't get into a long conversation or an argument of any sort. Just say this. Just say Z-Y-X-W-V-U-T-S-R-Q-P-O-N-M-L-K-G-I-S-G-F-E-D-C-B-A. And then you say, now, officer, I need to ask you if you can do that in two seconds. Because I need to warn you if you can, I'm putting you under a citizen's arrest, and I'll need to ask you to keep your hands where I can see them at all times. Now, let me quickly summarize for you the main points that you'll be able to get out of this book if you buy the book and if you read it. I don't have time, I'm sorry to say, to give you all the details and everything that's in the book, but maybe that's good because then you wouldn't buy it. 
But here are the most important points behind the book. There are three. Number one, the reason I'm writing this book is to make sure that everybody who reads the book will come to understand that the Fifth Amendment is just as precious, just as valuable for innocent people as it is for the guilty. And once upon a time, this was well known, once upon a time at least, among the educated, 50 years ago, the US Supreme Court handed down about a dozen different opinions in which they reaffirmed again and again and again that there's nothing terribly incriminating about the fact that someone chooses to exercise the fifth, that innocent people, perhaps even more than the guilty, have ample reason, numerous reasons, to assert the Fifth Amendment. And therefore, no particularly probative inferences either way can be drawn from the fact that somebody chose to remain silent. To those who understand how the system really works, the fact that somebody chose not to talk to the police is no more reliable evidence of guilt than the fact that and he also asked for breakfast every morning while he was in custody, just like all the guilty people do. Yeah, sure they do, but so do the innocent. Number two. You have no idea, unless you've got at least 20 years of experience in the criminal justice system in America today, you have no idea how many different ways there are in which you can get yourself convicted of some crime that you did not commit. Or worse yet, perhaps, some crime you never even heard of or ever in your wildest dream would ever imagine could be a crime just by talking to the police. And number three, you will not believe, and I dare say most readers of the book will be literally astounded at how complicated and how hazardous it has become now in recent years, in just the last three years, for you to exercise the Fifth Amendment. Let me give you a little bit of additional detail about all of those points. Next question, who needs to read this book? Well, there are two groups of individuals. You're wondering, am I the guy who needs to read this book? Well, yes, you are, absolutely, without a doubt. There are two groups of individuals who absolutely need to read this book, and they need to read it before it's too late. The first group is potential criminal suspects. Not necessarily guilty, guilty or innocent. If there's any possibility that someday, perhaps soon, perhaps in the distant future, perhaps when you least expect it, the police may find themselves in possession of evidence that persuades them maybe you were involved in or know something about a crime. Maybe it was a crime you never heard of, which is not unlikely, which is not unusual. The, the federal government today has over 10,000 criminal statutes on the books when you count all the tens of thousands of criminal federal regulations that are incorporated by reference into the terms of the US Penal Code. And how, who is that, by the way? Who, who in this room is somebody who might someday be a potential criminal suspect? Of course, the answer is everybody. And you can't comfort yourself with the assurance that, well, I know in my heart I'll never do anything wrong. That doesn't matter. Maybe some mistaken or confused but sincere and credible sounding eyewitness might mistakenly identify you as somebody who was there. Maybe you were there at the scene. Doesn't mean you were involved, but you're one of the leads. You may be the only lead that they've got. If you are a potential criminal suspect, you need to read this book. Or if any of your children might someday become a criminal suspect, they need to read this book before they are taken into custody. Or before, more likely, the police don't take them into custody, but simply say, you might come down to the office on a voluntary basis, down to the station. You're not under arrest. It's strictly voluntary. You can leave at any time. They like to say this to your kids, to deceive them, to get the kid's guard down. Sometimes it's grotesquely deceptive, because sometimes they won't tell the kid that the truth is we've already got a pretty solid identification of you as the suspect from a witness who may be mistaken, but the police don't know that. And they already know that no matter how this interview ends, your kid will be put in handcuffs, and he will be taken away and put in jail. But they don't tell the kid that, because they're hoping first we can get him to voluntarily cooperate, waive his rights, and talk to us. And we don't have to give him the Miranda warnings if he's not technically in custody. At that point, your kid won't know anything about what's going down, because you won't have time to get a hold of him, and you won't have time to put this book in his hands. And if you call the police office and say, you mind if I talk to the kid, they'll lie to you, and they'll say, no, we can't arrange that, which is a lie, because they could if they wanted, they just won't. And if the kid says, uh, is it OK if I uh, get a lawyer? Can I maybe get a lawyer? Very often, they'll lie and say, no, we don't need that. We don't want that. You don't want that, which is a lie, because a lawyer could be arranged if they want to do that for you. The other group of individuals who really needs to read this book is everybody in this room or in this audience who might someday find themselves in a jury. Potential jurors need to be able to read this book. And you need to read it before it's too late so that you can explain to the other members of the jury. If somebody back there in the jury room is trying to insinuate, boy, you notice that guy? He didn't testify at the trial. I guess that's pretty clear indication that he probably did it. No, absolutely not. As I mentioned in the book, one important study of over 100 people who were exonerated after they had been falsely convicted of something they did not do revealed that almost half of them, approximately 40% of them, didn't testify at their trial. And these are people that we now know were, in fact, absolutely innocent. So if you find yourself, you might be in either one of those groups, you need to read this book. And almost every one of us could, of course, be in group number two. Any one of us could someday become a member of a jury, unless, of course, perhaps you have a felony conviction, then you probably won't be in a jury. But if you have a felony conviction, you're twice as likely to find yourself in group number one. So either way, you've got to read the book. <laughs> Next question I frequently get, I often get this one. Well, if I take the fifth, though, won't that look suspicious? Won't the police think that I look guilty if I take the fifth? Good news, the answer is no, emphatically no, absolutely not. You will not look guilty to the police. And why do I say that? Because the police know from years of experience that Truth be told, most suspects probably are guilty, and most guilty criminals are not that, not that smart. 
Some of them are stupid, and most stupid people waive the right to remain silent. Okay, so if you want to look like a guilty person, you want to open your mouth and start talking. Talk if need be for 8, 10, 12 hours. That's what guilty people usually do. You see, it's absolutely false to suppose that there's two groups of people out there. There's the guilty ones who keep quiet, and the smart ones, I'm sorry, the innocent ones uh, who talk. That's what most laymen mistakenly suppose, but that's not true, and the police know that it's not true. No, the reality is there's two groups of individuals out there. There are those who are sophisticated enough to understand how the American criminal justice system works. This includes, by the way, every defense attorney, every prosecutor, every police officer, every judge, and all of their children and nieces and nephews. Those people never talk to the police, period. And then there's this other group that waives their right to remain silent and does talk. And that group includes a lot of guilty people and a lot of innocent people. But all they have in common is that they don't know how the system works. But although the police won't think you look guilty, they will pretend that they think that. Because they know that's how you think. And they will pretend that they believe it themselves to help trick you into talking with them, as Tim said a few minutes ago. A common tactic, a, a very common tactic that is used by the police is to start insinuating things. Oh, you want to take the fifth? You want a lawyer? Why? What do you got to hide? Why would an innocent person want to add, exercise the right to remain silent? The next time a cop tells you that, you just hand him a copy of this book and don't say another word. Say, read the book and you'll understand. He won't need to read the book. He already understands. He's lying to you, but that's what they do. What about the jury? What about the jurors? If the jurors learn that you told the police that you would not answer their questions, will they think you look sort of guilty? Will they think that may be evidence of guilt? Well, I need to be honest with you. Yes, they probably will. Tragically, sadly, unfortunately, yes. You don't have to take my word for it. More than 50 years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States of America said that too many people, even those who ought to know better, too often assume that the invocation of the Fifth Amendment privilege is tantamount to a confession of guilt. And it's still true to this day. Indeed, as I'll show you in a few minutes, that's even tragically now become a description of a majority of the justices on our US Supreme Court. Unless, luckily for you, one of the members of the jury has read this book and can explain to the others, no, it's not what you think. There are lots of innocent people out there who take the fifth all the time, including 100% of the police and 100% of their kids. Until recently, that was not even an issue. The famous viral video that Mr. Lynch mentioned a moment ago, which has been seen over 10 million times, I've got to find some way to get that offline, because when I made that talk eight years ago, there was no need for me to get into the details, as this book does, about how you do and how you don't want to assert the Fifth or exercise the Fifth Amendment privilege. It wasn't really a thing. It wasn't an issue. Up until five years ago, just about 100% of all the criminal defense attorneys in the country regularly told their clients, listen, here's what you say. It's printed on the back of my business card. On the advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. It seemed like harmless fun. It didn't really matter how you said it or what you said, because the universal consensus up until a few years ago was the jury would never find out that you said anything at all. In the Miranda decision, almost exactly 50 years ago today, the US Supreme Court took it as evident, self-evident, that of course you can't use it against the defendant that he chose to assert his right to remain silent, or even that he stood mute in the face of police interrogation, because that was not logical or legal or constitutional. Oh, but oh my goodness, how far we have come, as I'll explain in just a few minutes. As, as I will explain to you, and as the book explains in much greater detail, unfortunately, in just the last several years, the exercise of the Fifth, of the fifth Amendment has now become a veritable minefield that must be very, very carefully navigated. The good news is that it's not hard to do. The bad news is I don't have time to tell you how to do it. You'll have to get the book. <laughs> and help me finance the operations of the Duane Family Foundation. Here's some of the key points that you will learn in this book when you get the chance to pick it up. I will share with you in the book the astounding and dishonest tricks and tactics that our police officers use all over the country, all day, every day, and all night, too, to deceive you and your family and your young people into thinking it is in your best interests, interest to talk. You'll be amazed at some of the examples, many examples in here, of incredible deceptions and falsehoods that were told by police officers, criminal suspects, to get them to waive their right to remain silent. Telling them things such as, oh, you're not really a suspect. You're one of ours. You're on our side. You're gonna, we're going to use you as a prosecution witness and Johnny against the other kids. You're on our team. This is off the record. We won't use it against you. We won't tell anybody about it. We're not recording this. We know you're not a murderer. We know you're not guilty of any crime. We know you didn't do it. We know you didn't, weren't there. You can easily understand how after five, six, seven hours, if need be, of unrelenting interrogation assurances like these could easily break down the will of even an innocent, exasperated suspect that are thinking, well, if it's off the record and they say they're not going to prosecute me, what have I got to lose? Apparently, I got to tell them whatever they want me to say if that's what I got to do to get out of here. And then they find themselves, 20 years later, fighting frantically with the help of the Innocence Project to prove that they were innocent all along. And as the book explains, psychological research has confirmed that these tactics, tragically and paradoxically, are most effective on the innocent, even more so than on the guilty. Because innocent people who know in their heart that they weren't there and didn't do it are the ones who are most likely to deceive themselves into thinking, well, 
If this is what I've got to say, they want me to say that I was there and that I was involved, uh, I'll, I'll say it, but then I'll get a great lawyer for myself. I'll hire some, one of those great fast-talking lawyers on YouTube and he'll be able to get me off. That ain't gonna happen. And once you've made a confession that's on videotape and then it contains details that only the real killer would have known, which the police will be sure to take care of every time, there's very little a fast-talking YouTube lawyer can do to get you off. It'll almost never happen. In the book, you will also learn why you cannot and must not believe one word from the mouth of a police officer who's trying to get you to waive your rights. And I mean literally, not one word. The examples in the book will blow your mind of the things that they're allowed to get away with by the courts. In one case that is described in the book, read the case of a family that was trying to find out what had happened to their daughter who had recently been abducted. Unbeknownst to them, the police mistakenly suspected that the father might have been involved in her abduction, which, by the way, is not unusual because one police officer recently told a friend of mine that nine times out of ten, the one who calls in the crime is the one who did it, which is not true, but that's what you're up against in the mind of some police officers if you call them just as a witness. You have no idea whether you're just a witness. They'll tell you, oh, we know you're just a witness. We know you weren't involved, but you can't believe what these people say. In the case from Illinois that I mentioned a moment ago, the police officers, unbeknownst to the parents, found the girl's body, drowned, dead, but they weren't yet done with their investigation. They thought that the father might be involved. They wanted to question him, but they didn't want to tell her that she was dead and that he was a suspect and that he was in custody because then they'd have to read him his rights. So they didn't even tell the parents the girl had been found. Pretending falsely that they were still engaged in an effort to find her alive, they took advantage of his good intentions. They took advantage of the fact that he would naturally want to cooperate with them in what he thought was an ongoing investigation to recover this girl. And he went down to the station and they questioned him for more than an hour, trying to extract from him anything they could use to pin the murder on him without even telling him that the girl was dead. My friends, you need to understand, the next time you make the mistake of going downtown for a voluntary interview and you let them shut that door, you have no idea whether your loved ones are dead or alive. You have no idea whether your loved ones are in the next room saying, I've got a lawyer here, and the lawyer wants to meet with him. And I've hired a lawyer, and the lawyer's right here too. The police will say, sorry, he hasn't asked for a lawyer yet, so we're not obligated to put the two of them together. And no, we don't have to tell your kid that there's a lawyer out here that you've hired to represent him. You have no idea what's going on outside the, uh, that door. But the good news is nobody who reads this book will ever go through that door again, because you've gone to the other side of the looking glass if you make that horrible mistake. You will also learn in this book the incredibly dishonest things that our judicial system routinely says to excuse the dishonesty on the part of the police. You'll read about cases in this book where police officers said the most grotesquely sort of deceptive and dis disingenuous things to the criminal suspects, saying, oh, we know you're not a murderer. If you didn't premeditate this, if it was an impulsive sudden thing, that's no big deal. That was a promise that was given to somebody in Illinois, a young man who was then prosecuted for murder and sentenced to prison for 45 years after he was told by the police, oh, that's not a big deal. And the court said, oh, we don't see how that could be construed as a promise of leniency which is ridiculous and preposterous and painfully false. And the court knew that it was, but that's what they had to say to affirm the conviction, and that's what they said. You can't trust the courts to, to, affect, to protect your rights and to defend your rights. You've got to stand up for yourself. You've got to stand up for your own rights, and you've got to know what they are. Another key point that you'll get out of the book. In the book, you'll read the reading test, or if you've got the audio version, the listening test that everybody fails. In this book, I've got a short paragraph of facts that you'll be asked to read, and then a short list of questions, only four, that you'll be asked to answer about the very short set of facts that you were just given. I've used this same test on over 1,000 people around the country in the past five years, and everybody gets it wrong. Everybody. 99.9%. .9%, and you will, too believe it or not. And then you will see how I go on to explain how it is that this fact about human nature, the fact that our memories kind of trick us sometimes into thinking that we've read something or heard something, the truth is we really didn't read or didn't really hear, can and regularly is used by police officers to get people convicted, many innocent people as well, because we're so often wrong about what we think we heard. You see, the problem is during the course of the interrogation, after you've been there with them for hours, three, four, five, maybe six hours, relentlessly employing them one more time, they'll try to get you to talk again and again to keep you in there. They'll pretend to be open-minded. They'll pretend to be undecided, even though they're nothing of the sort. Well, I'm not sure. I'm still kind of confused. Let's take it one more time from the top. And after hours of this process, it's not unnatural and it's not unusual for somebody to slip up and to inadvertently reveal that apparently he or she assumes something that, truth be told, the cops didn't even tell you and haven't helped you if that detail actually happens to coincide with the facts of the case because then you've just incriminated yourself. One study described in the book talks about how an examination of 40 different wrongful confections, confessions given by people who later turned out to be innocent, all of them convicted, Almost every single one of them allegedly contains some detail that only the real killer would have known. How in the world does that happen? It does happen, and it will happen to you virtually every chance if you give the police the opportunity. You'll also learn from the book, one of the most important points of all, that your common sense and your intuition are useless to you when you are trying to decide whether you should talk to the police. And while you must not listen to those countless skeptics and cynics out there online 
who are constantly trying to dismiss my video and dismiss my book and dismiss my work by suggesting, well, he's kind of exaggerating. The situation is actually a little more nuanced than that. We can't say never because there's this interesting counterexample. These people drive me nuts. So many people out there, intellectual lightweights on the internet, plenty of them, who amuse themselves endlessly, boasting to all the world, oh, look, look at this imaginative counterexample I've come up with. What about this case, professor? What if you're hanging from a cliff and nobody come, and you're about to fall to your death and somebody walks by and it's a police officer, can you talk to him? You know, these people are the biggest part of the problem. What they don't see, what they don't understand, and what they're always trying to count, constantly suggest is, oh, I can come up with an interesting counterexample of that. You don't think I can do that. I mean, any rule that you can think of. There are lots of wonderful, excellent rules of thumb we teach our children. Don't drive at night over 80 miles an hour with your headlights off. That's a very good rule of thumb with virtually no exceptions. Don't jump into a shark tank when they're eating is a real good bit of advice. Oh, professor, but what if there's a raging fire right behind you in the shark? <laughs> What if driving 80 miles a night is the only way to get away from a raging wildfire that is coming upon the peak at the rate of 75 miles from the back? You know what? Right, that's great. You're so clever. Yes, you're so clever. But I defy you to find an example out there in the real world of anybody who ever got themselves out of a great deal of trouble because they talked to the police and shared information that really couldn't wait a couple of hours. It couldn't really wait a couple of days. Oh, yeah, we can make up examples like that. What are the odds? Maybe one in a million. I guarantee you, next time you find yourself in a situation where your intuition and your common sense tell you, OK, you're good to go. This is risk free. You go ahead and talk. You go for it, girlfriend. Don't listen to that lying voice because that lying voice is ignorant, doesn't understand what you're up against. The odds that you'll be able to talk your way out of a criminal conviction that you could not have avoided by waiting are one in a billion. And the odds are incomparably greater that you will unwittingly talk yourself into a jail cell perhaps for the rest of your life. Let me prove it to you. Let me give you just a couple of quick examples all from the book. Let me see how reliable your intuition and your common sense are. Michael Morton, we all know this fella, he served more than 20 years in a Texas prison of a life sentence for a murder that he didn't commit. He was an innocent man, we now know, because of DNA and other evidence. He tried to help the police find out who murdered his wife one day while he was gone to work one morning. Went away to work, while he was gone, somebody broke into the house and killed his wife. During the course of their investigation, as is typical, the police quickly came to suspect him because they had no other suspects and they want to have the psychological comfort that comes with closing the case. And they interrogated him for hours, asking all kinds of questions that common sense confirms could not possibly have been calculated to try to lead to the real killer, among other things. They asked him, well, let's retrace the last couple of days. Where did you and your wife have dinner the night before? Well, he told them. He told them where and when his wife went out for dinner the night before somebody else broke into the house and murdered him. Now, if you were sitting there in his situation, and you were in that position, and you were trying to help the police solve this murder of your wife, ask yourself for a minute. Do you think there's any way if I tell them the truth, if I know that I'm innocent and I tell them the truth about where and when my wife had dinner the night before, how in the world could that be used to help frame me and potentially convict me of a murder that I know I didn't commit? So be honest with you. Ask yourself. Raise your hand if you say, I honestly don't see how that could be used to help convict me. Yeah, look at all those hands. God, good for you. I appreciate your honesty. And the rest of you are lying. What are you, police officers? Um, no, no, the truth is that fact that he did give them the truth, and that information was used to help convict him of her murder. And as I say, he spent 20 years in prison. How did he do it? No time to tell you, but read the book and you'll find out. Here's another one, Glenn Ford. He was convicted of murder in Louisiana more than 30 years ago. He spent more than 30 years on death row before he was released just last year after DNA and other evidence proved that apparently, whoops, sorry, we got the wrong guy once again. How was he convicted? Well, he tried to help the police find out who had murdered a shopkeeper in his town. While he was there, they asked him, do you mind telling us where and when you were at a certain time? This guy, because he knew he was innocent, and by the way, we all now know that he was innocent, he made the mistake of thinking, well, I guess I might as well tell them, because he thought, well, luckily for me, fortunately for me, I've got an airtight alibi. I've got a couple of friends who could verify that I was with them in another part of town that same day, that same time. How many of you would be tempted to say, okay, I might as well go ahead and share that information with the police. This is risk-free. This can only help. This can't possibly hurt. You're wrong. You're all wrong. You see, you can't rely on your intuition. In fact, read the book. You'll see how he gave them accurate and truthful information about where he was at the time of the crime, and they were able to use that information to help convict him of the murder that he did not commit. Here's another one, a real case. A criminal suspect was told by the police that he had been identified by the victim in a lineup. All he said at that point was, then she is mistaken. Four words, she's mistaken. That's all he said, he denied it. He asserted his innocence. Can those four words possibly be used to convict him of a crime that he didn't commit? Yeah, it was used and it can be used. Here's another one. Suppose an innocent man is told by the police that he's a suspect in a crime. But the truth is, he wasn't even in that part of the town at night. He was 50 miles away. He can't prove it. He's got no alibi witnesses who can confirm it. But he tells them truthfully, no, I wasn't, in, I wasn't in that vicinity. I was 50 miles away. Could that information, assuming it's true, be used to possibly implicate him in the commission of the crime? Truth be told, most of you, if pressed, would have to say, I can't see how it could be, which only proves my point. You're wrong. It can be. 
and people have been convicted because they gave information like that to the police. One last thing I want to share with you about the book. As I said, the book teaches you the surprising number of ways in which our exercise of the Fifth Amendment has now become a veritable minefield. This was not true until five years ago. It has become extremely perilous. The book explains what you need to say and what you must not say when you are trying to assert your rights. You will see how easy it is today under the current law where a clumsy or a careless or a casual or an imprecise invocation of the Fifth Amendment can in fact be used against you in a court of law as if it were an admission of guilt. You can also learn how a careless invocation of your Fifth Amendment privilege can also lead you to the prosecution for the separate offense of lying to the police, which is a separate crime. And the last thing you want to do when you're trying to avoid being prosecuted for murder is to end up putting yourself in a position where you can get prosecuted for the crime of lying to the police when actually you shouldn't have said a word at all. And the book will also explain why you must not worry about seeming polite and respectful when you are talking to the police about your legal rights. I am not suggesting in any way that you should go out of your way to be rude or impolite. That's ridiculous. That's counterproductive, and I'm not suggesting anything of the sort. But the book explains about the countless cases in which real, live, innocent suspects made the tragic mistake of thinking, well, I guess I better take the edge off what I'm saying. If I sound too unequivocal about what I'm saying, the police might take offense. They might take it as, a, as an insult. So I don't want to make it sound like I think I definitely need a lawyer. I'll just be kind of tentative. Maybe I need a lawyer? You think maybe I could have a lawyer? Is that OK if I get a lawyer? <laughs> You want to know what happens when you talk that way to the police? You end up in a prison cell. This book tells you how it happens, and this book tells you how to avoid it. <laughs> finally, finally, uh, I mentioned earlier that 50 years ago, the Supreme Court said, you can't use the Fifth Amendment against somebody as evidence of guilt. And that was taken as unquestioned by the Supreme Court just 50 short years ago. But oh, how far we have come. My dear friend, Justice Scalia, who was my hero in so many other ways, was the leader until his death on the court of the view that actually only guilty people have any real reason to protect or to care about the Fifth Amendment. He wrote that the problems caused by the risk of self-incrimination are wholly of the guilty suspect's own making, because an innocent person will not find himself in a similar quandary. It's a tragedy that he didn't live to read the book. He would have seen how painfully wrong he was about that. And Justice Alito, another giant of the court, subscriber to the same madness, just three years ago in the horrible case of Salinas v. Texas, he wrote the opinion for the court, the plurality opinion, in which the court held that the exercise of your Fifth Amendment rights, if you don't do it just the right way, can now be used against you in a court of law as evidence of your guilt. And in a later case, also argued and won by the US Department of Justice that same year in the US Court of Appeals, they persuaded one circuit court of appeals to hold that your invocation of the Fifth Amendment can also be used against you as uh, evidence of your guilt. A lot of liberal critics have justifiably lamented this horrible, execrable holding of the court in that case and the fact that the opinion was handed down by the five most conservative justices on the court, the, five, the only five Republican appointees on the court. But the truth be told, to give credit and blame where they are respectively due, the dissenting opinion written by the so-called liberals in that case would have been even worse for you and me and for the defense of our liberties. And to give blame where blame is due, Justice, uh, the, the, the opinion in Salinas v. Texas was an opinion Although it was written by the most conservative members of the court, the US Department of Justice, the Eric Holder, Barack Obama's Justice Department filed an amicus brief in the court urging the court to do just a, such a thing to which we as a nation could justly cry out, thanks, Obama. What is wrong with the Supreme Court? The final question that I'll ask and share with you, well, I, I can give you the answer. Scalia himself answered that question. Shortly before his death, he wrote, truthfully, we federal judges live in a world apart from the vast majority of Americans. After work, we retire to homes in placid suburbia or to high-rise co-ops with guards at the door. They're out of touch, and it's not their fault. They don't have any idea what peril the rest of us face in any ordinary routine encounter with the police. Justice Sotomayor, just for this year, speaking at Brooklyn Law School, correctly complained that there are no criminal defense lawyers on the court right now. In, in the name of diversity, we worry so much about getting people on the court who are a uh, different gender or a different race. And yet we've got nine people on the court. At the time of Scalia's death, we had nine people on the court, none of whom had ever done any significant criminal defense work at all. None of whom had ever been arrested or charged or prosecuted with a crime. None of whom probably ever had met an innocent person who was ever prosecuted or convicted of a crime. We had nine people at the time on the court, almost all of whom had spent virtually all of their entire professional adult lives working for the government. And most of them, several of them at least, working as US attorneys. That's the problem. We need real diversity on the court. We need somebody who's actually, who cares passionately about the defense of American constitutional and civil liberties, which, of course, leads naturally to my last question. I see one's coming in right now from Twitter. Will you please agree to serve on the Supreme Court? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> I am here. I am here today for the first time in American history. This is the first time a candidate has ever announced his, his candidacy for a position in the US Supreme Court on the internet. If you know or have any contact with Donald Trump, I want you to send an email to him on Twitter, say, Dear President Trump, 
And we'll use hashtag Justice Duane. That's how we'll do this. You let him know that you support my candidacy. If you believe that somebody like me ought to be put on the Supreme Court, you let uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump know that's how you feel. I'm wearing your tie, as you can see. If you don't know Donald Trump, but you know how to get a hold of Kevin Bacon, let him know, because he, I understand, is not uh, too disconnected from Donald Trump. He can get in touch with virtually anybody, I'm told. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you.